Hey, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. We're continuing our series about all the 16 Myers-Briggs personality types. And today we're talking about the ISTJ personality type in the Myers-Briggs system or the memory effectiveness personality in the personality hacker system. We just recently went over the ISFJ personality type. So if you haven't heard that one, I recommend doing so because we we flesh out a lot of these concepts around being an ISJ and leading with the cognitive function introverted sensing or what's called memory. And this process shows up a little differently for ISTJs than it does for ISFJs. So it's going to, it, we'll definitely be fleshing out some of those nuances. But if you haven't heard the ISFJ, I do recommend going listening to that. I also recommend listening to the podcast on the sensing personality types to get a more in-depth concept around what we call the driver cognitive function or the driver process. For a frame of reference, you may want to go to our website, personalityhacker.com. And in the search bar on that website, type in car model. It'll bring up an article where you can read about a, a framework we use to explain personality type. We call it the car model. And it's basically, there's four positions in the car. There's a driver, a co-pilot. In the back seat, there's a 10-year-old. And then right behind the driver sits a three-year-old process. And we, we've given these nicknames uh, for you as an ISTJ that we're going to go over in a minute here. But this framework of the car model is important to see how your personality is configured and how the different parts of your mind, the mental wiring of your mind are configured and how they're interplaying with each other. If you have that in front of you as a framework, you're going to have a lot better time following along with what we talk about today on this podcast. So why don't we get right into that car model? So the, there's a driver, a co-pilot, a 10-year-old that sits behind the co-pilot, and a three-year-old that sits behind the driver process, as Joel just mentioned. And these are these represent the parts of your mind that influence your personality the most. The driver process is a process that's technically called introverted sensing, and we've nicknamed this process memory. Memory is a learning process. It's technically called a perceiving process. It's how you as an ISTJ show up and see your world. It's how you perceive your world. What memory is... What memory does is it takes in sensory information. Now, when we talk about sensory information, we're not just talking about your five senses. We're also talking about the sense of balance, the sense of time. There are a lot more senses than just our five physical senses. And what memory, this introverted sensing does, is it it brings in a lot of information as you move through the world, but it post-processes that information for later. So you you begin to bring information in, and, and then inside of yourself, you kind of say, okay, where does this reconcile with me? How do I perceive my world based on how this is impacting me on an internal level as I as I perceive the world? So it's a lot of post-processing, a lot of past orientation, a lot of uh, absorbing information and then figuring out what that information means for you as an ISTJ over time. Right. And the reason why the memory process works this way is because the focus for ISJs is on reliable information. So what's more reliable than information you've taken in through your senses and then had time to ruminate on and really asked like what it was important there? Where have I seen this before? How does this impact me? So it's really a focus on what is reliable. It's comparing and contrasting your internal experience, what you've seen before and precedent there. It's also comparing and contrasting the external precedent and experience. So what have traditionally, what has traditionally been done? What are the standards around things? What have other people in the past, whether it's recent past or distant past, done with this information? How have they procedurized it or how has this impacted them? And all of this comes into an interplay with you internally and you compare the external world and the internal world. And now you understand how you're seeing the world based on all of these external or internal metrics that you've set up for yourself. So just like with the ISFJ podcast, we talked a lot about how this memory process can be very adaptable over time because all these pieces of information that you're taking in and ruminating on and understanding the significance of they become part of how you see yourself. They become part of your identity. But unlike ISFJs that couple this with a feeling process of extroverted feeling or harmony, 
ISTJs instead couple this with a thinking process. So the co-pilot in that car model is called extroverted thinking. That's its technical name, but we've nicknamed that effectiveness. So this is a lot more about systems and metrics and how things work, getting things done, making sure that the systems in your life are running smoothly. And this really alters the dynamic of the relationship of these processes. And that's why ISFJs and ISTJs can be very different from each other. So for an ISFJ, it's more about how people are impacting your experience. For ISTJs, it's more about how getting things done and systems around you are impacting your experience and your identity. So there's a strong relationship with your who you see yourself as and how you see yourself and how you see your identity and the way you're able to impact your world, how you're doing professionally. What are the systems you've set up for your family? How are you able to move through the world and really accomplish your goals? That becomes a lot more about your identity. And so things like, you know, like uh, being efficient become really important to you. Things like moving up in leadership and making sure that you're getting your job done well and that you're doing the best job that you can and that you're able to figure out how, you know, your professional world is supposed to look. All of that becomes a lot more about your identity than just your relationships. Because that that effectiveness process is concerned with making things happen and getting things done, we all know that things have to happen in sequence. In the real world, you, you can't put a roof on a house until the basement's built and you build the walls and then the roof goes on. There's a sequence to building a house. It has to happen in an order. So effectiveness gets really good at creating project management frameworks, understanding how things have to be done in a sequence from start to finish and understanding how to accomplish something in terms of a sequence. Now, apply that to not just building a house, for example, but let's say it's your career. In your career, you're going to want to know what's the next step or steps that I'm going to be taking. So as you start your career as an ISTJ, you're going to be very concerned, most likely, on making sure you do things that are going to put you on a trajectory, a logical sequence of the career path you want. This is something that effectiveness does well. It says, okay, I want to be a vice president of this bank someday. I know in order to be vice president of the bank someday, I've got to start off maybe as a teller, and then I've got to work maybe in the loan office or the loan department. I've got to work myself up into a manager role. I need to get the attention of other managers and other people in leadership that are going to notice me. And you all of a sudden begin to construct and see a logical sequence for the thing that you want to have happen in the external world. And you build you build procedures and processes toward that. I think this is our strength for IST, for you as an ISTJ. I think you naturally get a sense of, I want this to happen, so I'm going to build a method or a procedure to make this happen. And you can see a lot of ISTJs ending up in managerial roles, in project management roles, a lot of a lot of uh, working to make sure things are handled. Uh, we did a survey, and a lot of ISTJs came back on the survey saying, look, you give me a project and you task me with responsibility, please don't keep checking up on me because I will get that done. I know the steps needed to make it happen. I will implement those steps and I'm very proficient at building a system or following a system that's been set up to get that accomplished. So don't mess with that because I'm really good at that. I would love just to be left alone and and function with my superpower. You could see how this combination of the memory process wanting to be careful, wanting things to be reliable, combined with wanting to think things through in a sequence with that effectiveness process, you could see how ISTJs need a lot of lead time. They're very they're very thoughtful. They need a lot of time to prepare. They want to be able to really think things through. They want to be able to be reliable so they don't have a tendency to say yes to things that they can't follow through with their commitments. Reliable becomes a, that becomes like a catchphrase for ISTJs. They want to be reliable and they want to be able to rely on other people. So quick decision making, forcing them into a time pressure situation, uh, re- like requiring a response right away when you ask them a question. These are all things that are, are anxiety producing for ISTJs. However, over time, because they are so focused on how systems work, Uh, One of the survey responses we got was from somebody who said, yeah, initially, I definitely am by the book. I'm definitely by the book. I'm going to be very careful in how I learn a new job or learn a new set of 
you know, projects or responsibilities, I'm definitely going to go buy the book initially. But over time, I'm going to be able to see where I can maybe bend the rules or maybe, you know, I, it wasn't a phrase that they used to game the system, but that's kind of how I, as an ENTP, took it <laughs> because that's how I would see it is gaming a system. But it was more like I can see where I don't have to be by the book so much. And so once I get comfortable with a situation or a career or a job or that particular task or set of responsibilities, I get to a point where I understand where I can kind of go, well, that's not as necessary as maybe I was originally taught that it was, but this is definitely some place where I have to optimize and make sure that I'm on the stick over here, and maybe that wasn't as focused on. So what ends up happening is the more comfortable an ISTJ gets with their with their job, right, with their professional job or their career or whatever, the the better they get at optimizing. They're better at systematizing because that's what they're focused on and creating systems that can be replicated for everyone. And I think that's one of the reasons why I've always seen ISTJs as somebody who brings order to madness. They're so good at writing procedures. They're so good at getting like a really good careful, thoughtful concept around how things are working and how things should work. And then and then being able to encapsulate that in like a procedure. And that's really where they shine. Now, that can be really annoying to an ISTJ to have to enter a space of chaos and have to enter a space where people might not be super, you know, reliable, reliable, or they're not doing things congruently. They're maybe you know, shaking things up every time. And that probably feels very chaotic to an ISTJ. And of course, that's going to be more like creative types or people like my type who have a tendency to just go in and try to game everything initially and try to optimize in without maybe having a holistic perspective like the ISTJ would want somebody like me to. And at the same time, that's where they excel is by bringing order to that form of chaos, making sure that all of the details that are important aren't being ignored in favor of getting through something maybe faster or being able to tailor it to the individual. They go, no, this is a step that has to happen. It's very important for the step to happen. So then they create a procedure that doesn't neglect those steps. We were recently, we recently took our daughter Piper to Disney World for a couple of days. We just flew down really quick and came back and we ride the, when we're there, we get on the, the Walt Disney World public transportation system. They've got like an internal transportation system there. And they have a lot of buses. There's like this bus station at this one area you catch a bus at. And it's very efficiently set up, probably set up by an ISTJ, where the buses come in on one area, they load and they go out. It's extremely efficient, extremely well designed for efficiency and effectiveness. And there was an ISTJ that was in charge of making sure the buses would pull up and load and unload correctly. They were basically directing traffic. They had a little radio set, and they were radioing to different bus drivers pulling in and out. And they had a little tablet where they were marking off which location the buses were in and the queue lines for getting people on the buses and organized in the most efficient and effective manner. And I was watching this IST, I think it was a woman, ISTJ woman, that was doing this. And she was she was monitoring monitoring the difference, you know, the different timelines for the buses. There was this queue of buses coming in and she was watching the people in the queue lines to optimize the experience to to be the most efficient. She wasn't paying attention necessarily to the individual needs of the of on a on a micro level with people. Like if a mom's kid was screaming, she wasn't thinking, well, I need to get that bus in here first because that mom's kid's screaming and it's going to make her life less stressful. Maybe like an ISFJ would be interested in. But this woman's metric was focused more on everybody getting on these buses in time and not gumming up the works for the entire system, the system wide. She was more interested in and focused. I was watching her direct traffic on making sure that all the buses were running on time. Some people needed to take hits in the midst of that. Like that mom with the kid screaming wasn't going to get her bus first just because her kid was screaming. But everybody that was there waiting for buses was still going to get on the buses on time because this ISTJ woman was very focused on making sure everyone's functionality was working properly. All the buses, the bus drivers, the buses, the people in the queue lines, it was all organized. And she was in real time managing the sequence of how this was going to happen. And the efficiency level that this person was able to create around this was amazing to me. I was like, man, I would love to be able to have that kind of efficiency in organization for a system. And obviously, there was there was one woman that began to cross the street where buses were coming, and it was clearly not a crosswalk. And they had to like rein her back, say, look, you can't go over there. I know you want to go over to that other side. 
It'll make your life easier, but you're going to mess up the entire timetable schedule for everyone here. So we've got to keep our buses on time and organized. I'm sorry you can't just go rogue on us. And I think this woman was very frustrated. They were pulling her back off the off the sidewalk and saying, you got to come over to this side and stand in this line like everybody else. I think people felt like there was it was impersonalized or depersonalized and there wasn't a lot of personal attention given. But really, the superpower here for the ICJ that was organizing everything was they actually were getting everybody's needs met. They were really helping a lot of people because they were structurally making sure that everything ran smoothly and effectively and efficiently for all parties involved. So I think for some of us types that we look to ISTJs as maybe procedural, and you as an ISTJ might think that you get dumped on at work or at home, like you create procedures and, and processes understand that we need that. It is a superpower you bring. And even though you get pushback from some people like us, we appreciate the fact that you're focused on making sure things are efficient, are effective, are on time, and things are running well, and projects are being done, and sequences are happening. That is a superpower you bring. However, as, as I say that, because you're an introvert, and you lead with that memory process, introverted process, Sometimes you as an ISTJ can literally skip past the superpower you bring to the world, which is that effectiveness, extroverted thinking process. You can skip past that instead of using that for your decision making. Sometimes when you're in a defensive position or you're not in a good space, you can go to what's, what's called the 10-year-old process, what we've called the 10-year-old process in your cognitive function stack. Its technical name is introverted feeling. It's got the, about the development level of a 10-year-old child. And it, we've nicknamed it authenticity. It's all about how you are impacted personally, how your feelings are impacted, and how you feel personally about an issue. This can really hijack your superpower. Because if you spend time here, if you skip past that effectiveness process and you spend time here, you're no longer making decisions on what will make things efficient and effective and get bottom line things done. Now you're starting to to, to make decisions on what is it impacting me? How do I feel about this? How does my ego feel? Or how do my personal feelings feel? And now once you start making decisions from that place as an ISTJ, you're no longer going to be in your superpower. You're going to maybe be in a defensive place. Yeah, there was, on the survey, we got some feedback about perfectionism, which was interesting because we got a lot of feedback about perfectionism on the ISFJ survey as well. But there seems to be a different flavor of perfectionism that shows up when an ISTJ is in this loop of going from the memory process, the driver, to the authenticity 10-year-old process and skipping that co-pilot process. For ISFJs, it's more about wanting to make sure that they're above reproach so people can't blame them for a bad experience. Like if somebody feels icky, the ISFJ doesn't want anybody to be able to blame them for that that icky feeling. And so they go overboard on trying to make sure that everything is perfect for everybody else. And and then when we talked a little bit about like the perfectionism extending to putting like plastic on your couch. So the couch is pristinely, you know, it's totally pristine, but of course that's not very comfortable. For ISTJs, it doesn't feel like it's about optimizing other people's experience. It's more about defending any sort of feedback that the ISTJ might get that they're sensitive to. It's about being sensitive to criticism. And I think it's because they can get surprisingly sensitive in that authenticity process, that introverted feeling process, if they think people are attacking them. So they'll get defensive and go to a more egocentric place. Like, I don't want to be questioned. I know what I'm doing. I don't want anybody questioning me. Uh, I don't want anybody to give me feedback that tells me I'm doing something wrong because I know what I'm doing. And that's understandable, especially if you have trouble as such an introvert. And I've noticed that ISTJs are some of the most introverted of the introverted types. If you have trouble communicating your ideas, if you have trouble trying to express what's going on for you, it's easy to see how people would get the wrong idea. They might perceive you as cold or they might perceive you as antisocial. They might perceive you as being, you know, mean or, you know, not, not, you know, if you're, if you're focused more on structural things as opposed to individuals, people might take, get the wrong idea that you're somehow not honoring them as a person. And as an ISTJ, I could totally see how a person would start to get an attitude. Like everybody seems to think that I have different intent than I actually do. People seem to think that I'm showing up as being cold, but I'm not. I'm actually quite warm. I'm actually quite caring, especially of the people in my life. So 
if people are questioning you and you're having trouble communicating, you're having trouble expressing your actual intent, I could see a, an ISTJ getting like really sort of egocentric or, pro, you know, being proud or having pride around being questioned. And that's, it's understandable, but it's also defensive. And just like with all the types, we've gone through all of these different personality types and talked about how they get defensive by going to that 10-year-old process. For an ISTJ, the key is not to be proud. It's not to it's not to try to defend against ego hits. It's really about getting back into that co-pilot process of effectiveness. If a person is giving you feedback that is hurting your feelings or giving you an ego hit, right, and your pride is now flaring up, the, the first question shouldn't be, why are they hurting my feelings or why are they attacking me? The first question is, where did the system fail? Is it in my communication? Was I not clear enough? Is it because they are not understanding where I'm coming from? What's the most effective way to get back into a simpatico relationship? Not to make sure necessarily that everybody's feeling good, but to make sure that you aren't having breaches of communication, that you aren't cross-wired, that you aren't having experiences where the whole system is, you know, failing or falling down. Like, how do we get back to an effective form of communication? And where can I be a part of that? Do I need to take some public speaking courses? Do I need to take some communication courses? What can I do to be better skilled at communicating my ideas to another person and not assuming that if they're getting the wrong impression, it's all on them? I think this authenticity piece can also show up on a macro level for you as an ISTJ feeling and and there's a nuance here. I think there's a there's a little bit of a superpower that supports your effectiveness process, but there's also a potential for this to go bad for you. There's a there's a possessiveness, a corporate possessiveness that sits in this authenticity process for you as an ISTJ. How does this show up? This show this shows up with with the idea of like patriotism for the country you live in. Okay, this shows up for you to say like well. I, I live in a small town and I'm only going to do business with other people that I feel possessive with around a communal experience of who I went to high school with, potentially. So like I live in a small town and Tony and I live in a really small town right now. And it's there's a lot of ISTJs that live in our town. And it's very difficult for us to break into the social scene here because we didn't go to high school in this town. And I think a lot of the ISTJs that live here have mapped themselves to say, I have a corporate identity with the other people I went to high school with in this town and have lived here their entire lives. I feel simpatico with them. I feel like we have possessiveness together. We own this town. This is our place together. Anyone who didn't grow up here or go to high school here, they're really outsiders. They didn't grow up. They're not really part of us. And I think this is a superpower to some degree when you you apply it in a positive way toward pride and like a patriotism, uh, a spirit of really... Like we're in this together. And I think there could also be a, a, a negative side to this too, where you're not open to new things or new people because you have a sense of protecting yourself against something that you don't identify with corporately. So there's a nuance here, and I want to be clear that I don't I don't think it's necessarily always a bad thing, but it could become a bad thing for you as an ISTJ if you double down on it and you're just not open to to any type of identity outside of that thing you've already mapped for yourself. Yeah, that's. I think that's why effectiveness or extroverted thinking as a co-pilot is so important. It's understandable to be xenophobic if you think new experiences are threatening. Just kind of like what we talked about in the ISFJ podcast. If you have grown up having imprints that new things or novelty is are they're threatening then you're going to double down on avoiding any newness. And that's going to keep you in, you know, it's going to keep you in a, in a really static mode. But if you aren't imprinted that everything that's new is threatening, if you're imprinted that new things might be friendly, you just aren't used to them yet, and you can hold space until you become used to it, then you're a lot less likely to reject ideas that might be really helpful for you. And if you look through the lens of effectiveness, which is, I might not be used to this idea, but I'm noticing that it's working, right? Like I'm observing that it's working in other contexts. So as opposed to full scale rejecting it because it's not familiar to me, I'm instead going to hold space and observe how it's playing out for other people and getting a concept of really being thoughtful around how we could implement something similar for us and make something better, like making these things you feel healthy pride around, healthy patriotism, 
by making them better and improving quality of life as opposed to trying to keep everything the same and then watching your quality of life lessen and lessen and then going, oh, it must be somebody else that's doing that. I think that's really where that co-pilot process of effectiveness makes up for the blind spot of the three-year-old process, which is called extroverted intuition or exploration. Now, that's that three-year-old process is the opposite of the driver. And the driver for all of us is the sweet spot. That's where we love to live. For ISTJs, that's memory. That's what they're familiar with. And the three-year-old process requires a, an acceptance of novelty, of exploration, of blazing new trails. This is going to be a blind spot for ISTJs, and that's okay, right? That's not where they're supposed to go. However, if you're in your co-pilot of effectiveness, you will be a lot more open to novelty, maybe not immediately, maybe not jumping on new bandwagons all the time, but rather having sort of a, a loose, loose hold on or a loose grip on this idea that we always have to be doing things, everything the same. You'll loosen your grip on that concept because you'll start to see the, the power of implementing new effective strategies. Now, it might not be immediate, might not be fast, but this is a way to make sure that you don't end up in that static place where where the the desire to keep everything the same is actually harming you. It's actually inefficient and ineffective. It's that shark that's not going forward in the water. You know, sharks, if they're not swimming, they're sinking. And for a lot of things, you know, progress requires an acceptance of the new. It might not be immediate, but it does eventually have to happen. So that effectiveness process really makes up for the blind spot of exploration. If you want to feel empowered as an ISTJ, if you want to show up as your best self and your superpower, and you want to feel like you're in control of your world, and, you're, and the world's not happening to you, because I, 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 I look around and I see a lot of ISTJs right now, in our, at least here in the United States, in our current Western culture, I think they feel like they grew up with a lot of things set for them, and all of a sudden change is happening really fast. And I think a lot of ISTJs, you might feel this way as an ISTJ, change is happening so fast for you that you feel like things are happening to you. You don't feel empowered. You don't feel like you can have any control or effect around it. And it's almost like that's an easy place to go and get defensive. Like, well, this is how we've always done it. This is how this is impacting me emotionally. This is how I feel about it. I'm not going to budge. I'm going to double down on this and really dig in my heels. Instead of going that route, I believe you're going to feel, and that's and that's a way to try to feel empowerment. That's your what you're after is feeling empowered and in control of the situation. And I think that's something that's important for you as an ICJ to feel. You want to feel like you're empowered and in control of the situation. Going to that effectiveness process and saying what works in the situation is going to give you that empowered feeling, that empowered framework, that empowered sense of I can actually affect change in my world. I'm not just on the receiving end of things but I'm actually in control of creating the world that I want to live in. So like, for example, in the small town we live in, a lot of new ideas are not always welcome because that's not how they've always been done. Things have worked for so long, so well, that why would we change things that aren't working? However, the world is changing. And the small town that we live in, change is happening to it right now. And I see, uh, I've seen a few ISTJs in town kind of double down and say, we're not going to budge. We're not going to do anything new. And they get defensive. And then I've seen other ISTJs say, you know what? What works in this situation? This new thing that might be coming in, is this effective? Is this working? Is this, is this actually changing things for the better? And I've seen the ISTJs that have adopted this framework of saying, oh, okay, I see this is working. This is effective. This is, this is efficient. This is helping our town grow or develop or get, you know, get things accomplished better. Those ISTJs are a lot happier. They're a lot more empowered. I see them going around with smiles on their faces, feeling like they've got control in their world, not like their world is happening to them. I think what happens too is the more you can implement effectiveness, the more you create a container for yourself and others mm. to be able to have fun. That was one thing I noticed on the survey that came up over and over is that a lot of ISTJs were like, I'm not a stick in the mud. I like to have fun too. I just want it to be predictable. <laughs> like if I'm going to have something new and something fun and something you know, spontaneous happen. I just want to know that it's not going to lead to disaster. And I think the more you can create a container in your world of safety, which effectiveness can do very well, it can set up systems and make sure that everybody is okay. The more you're able to relax into the systems that you created and the more you're able to loosen up. It's kind of like the person who said, I'm by the book until I figure stuff out and then I'm less by the book. 
it's creating your own safety container so that you don't have to always be making sure everybody's safe. Like you've created the container, you're used to the container, and now you can have fun and now you can sort of let your hair down. And I think ISTJs are actually really good at that. There's a quirkiness, there's a sense of play that they bring that they might just reserve for those that are closest to them, but it's still there and it's still a part of who they are. And really being able to open that up to even maybe people outside of your intimate family relationship. Feeling safe in a bigger group of people and not feeling so much anxiety around maybe new social situations or new people. Recognizing that you're going to be okay, that you've created containers or you've created systems where nobody's really threatening you. That's the, that's the space that an ISTJ gets to when they're more playful, they banter with other people more, and they don't always have to be so serious. I want to mention one final thing here as we wrap up. If you are a female ISTJ, you have, and we've mentioned this for a lot of thinker women and feeler men too, you have a unique situation that you're in as a female ISTJ because you use that effectiveness process. It's not as touchy-feely. It's not obviously feeling-oriented like... I think a lot of social projection has been given toward women. I think a lot of people project onto women that they have to show up in a very feeling way, in a very nurturing or, you know, like that harmony process that ISFJs use, for example. I think a lot of people have expectations for you as a woman to show up that way. And as an ISTJ, that doesn't come to you naturally because that's not how your mind is wired. And that's okay because that's not how your mind is wired. But there are templates that are set in our world often that expect things from you because of your gender. And this happens for, like, I'm a feeler man. This happens for me also on the feeler side. There's expectations of me as a man to show up in certain ways that just aren't authentic to me because I just, that's not how I'm wired. So as an ISTJ woman, I think I I just want to, I just want to give you this, that we understand you have a unique challenge in front of you and you're going you're gonna to rely upon, again, that effectiveness process. We, we keep saying this over and over again. We have seen through our study, through our research, through working with clients over many years, that ISTJs that get into this effectiveness process truly do feel empowered, whether they're female or male. It is a way for them to be able to interact with their world that gives them control. And like Antonia said, creating a container. I have an aunt who is an ISTJ and she, you know, she's, she's not, a, my, my dad actually used to call her Frank, <laughs> it nicknamed her Frank because she was so Frank. She would just say what she was thinking and be very, you know, she just did not couch things in any terms of like making sure she preserved anyone's feelings. Not to be mean, she was just very direct and it, he was a feeler and it always took him back and he would make jokes when I was a child about this, but she was very direct about things. And I always appreciate that about her growing up. I love the fact that she was direct And I loved going over to her place at the holidays. She would create a, she wasn't a hostess in the sense of creating a a harmony type space, but she created a very safe container for all of us to have a great experience. She was very effective in how she asked us to bring certain dishes. My mom would bring a dish. My uncle would bring, you know, people would bring different dishes to her house. And she constructed an environment and a set circumstance that allowed all of us to have a really good time when we were at her house. And she used her superpower of being in that effectiveness process to create that container and create the structure and create the order and the timeline for the entire event that we all got to have a great time around. So just rest into the fact that you do have a superpower as a woman, as an ISTJ woman, and that is that effectiveness process. And creating that container, creating that framework is how you're going to shine and how I think you're going to be able to move through the world that expects something different from you, potentially. You know, we've talked about how it, our 10-year-old process is actually an important part of who we are. We just don't want to skip the co-pilot and go straight to the 10-year-old. Yeah. But if we are really developing our co-pilot, then we can bring the 10-year-old into the equation in a far more healthy way. You're, you're using that 10-year-old process in service of the co-pilot, not vice versa. And, you know, talking about your Aunt Chris, I remember when you and I first met, it was under... I mean, I went and met your family under very stressful circumstances. It was actually at your grandfather's funeral. Like your mother and your Aunt Chris and your Uncle um, John, they lost their father. And the funeral, like I had already purchased tickets to come out, fly out and see you. I was on the West Coast. You were on the East Coast. I purchased tickets to come out to see you. And then we found out that your grandfather died and you had to drive to Florida to go to the funeral. And you're like, 
you want to go to the funeral with me? <laughs> and I was like, well, I guess I already have the tickets. <laughs> so I met your family under these really like, I mean, it was actually kind of a bad situation. And I just tried to show up authentic and I just tried to show up me. But at the same time, I tried to be really sort of like, you know, as opposed to like, here I am. I'm the new person in the family. It was it was far more, you know, sedate. And I just tried to be cool and, and you know, hold space, which as an ENTP, those are always weird waters to navigate for me is like knowing exactly what to do and how to make sure to get people's needs met. However, I did my best. And at the end of the week, because I think we were down there for like four or five days, at the end of the week, it was your Aunt Chris as the ISTJ. Now, there were a lot of feelers in your family that could have reached out to me. But it was your Aunt Chris who pulled me over to the side at the very end. And she goes, you did a really good job. This was really stressful. And I could tell that it was stressful for you. But you did you did really well. And that was it. That's all she said. And I was so... I was so touched that she had acknowledged that it was a difficult circumstance to meet your entire family on your mom's side. It was a difficult circumstance, but she had noticed that uh, it was complicated and complex and not easy. And she gave me kudos for that. Now, I don't know anybody who's more effectiveness than your Aunt Chris. Like, they have schedules to keep and you do not interrupt their schedules and they are on the stick all the time. And I mean, it's just like their whole world is systematized. And because she rests into that, because she has the ability to to have security in the systems that she set up, she can reach out to people on an ind- individual level. She can use authenticity not to go to an ego space or a pride space or get our feelings hurt, but rather to reach out to other people and connect with them on a one-on-one level, which I really appreciated. So I think when ISTJs have to, they have waters to navigate that are complicated and they're usually social. They're, you know, they're, they're, they have anxiety around meeting new people or they don't know what to say at parties or they hate small talk or what, how are they supposed to show up or people think of them as cold. Well, one of the best ways to do that is to make sure that you've got those systems set up that you feel secure in. And then now you're able to reach out to individuals using your authenticity process, not defensively, but actually proactively in a way you can really connect with another person and just have a moment of kindness or a moment of intimacy with them. And um, I find that to be I find that to be one of the best ways for an ISTJ's uh, for an ISTJ to get into that space of connecting with other people. So what do you think? We'd love to hear from you as an ISTJ. We'd love to hear your feedback, questions, comments. You can leave a comment directly below this podcast on our website, personalityhacker.com. You can just search ISTJ and you can find the actual podcast on our website. We'd love to engage in a conversation with you. You can also join our growing community of like minds, people that are interested in understanding their personal personality with the idea of using that information to grow yourself, grow yourself in personal development. You can find that over at facebook.com forward slash personality hacker or twitter.com forward slash personality hack. If you like our podcast, you can subscribe on iTunes and various Android platforms. And if you're in a giving mood, please feel free to leave a rating and review for us on iTunes. The more ratings and reviews we get over time, the better we do in iTunes is iTunes algorithm and they'll promote us in cross promote us on other podcasts and uh, and it actually really is helpful for us so if you're feeling a spirit of reciprocity please feel free to review review us and rate us on iTunes thank you so much for being a part of us this week on the personality hacker podcast we really appreciate you taking the time to spend time in this conversation with us and we do this for you. We really appreciate you being a part of this. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And this has been the Personality Hacker Podcast. We'll talk with you on the next episode. <laughs>